So a very popular verse Trinitarians like to use um, because they're basically desperate because the Trinity is just not found. The whole concept is not found. But one of the best texts they come up with is 1 John 5, 7. So let's read it. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. They say, see, it's the Trinity right there. Okay, for the sake of argument, let's say this verse is supposed to be in the Bible, right? Does it say these three are one God, right? And also it says the Father, the Word, right? Also the Word, this Jesus is never put like this ever, even in John 1, 1 right? Only once in Revelation we see that Jesus called the Word of God because he spoke it and fulfilled it. But it doesn't say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So for the sake of argument, it still doesn't say these three are one God. It just is not true. But the thing is, this whole verse isn't even supposed to be in the Bible. In the 1500s, a very renowned scholar and Christian and translator, a Bible scholar called Erasmus, uh, was translating Bibles. He had a few versions. But most of the Bibles at that time, they were translated from the Latin, right? From the, from the Roman Catholic interpretations basically because these scribes came up with all kinds of little changes and Erasmus wanted to make a translation based on the Greek so when Erasmus translated first John chapter 5 he did not put this verse in there why not because he could not find it in any Greek manuscript this whole the the father the word and the spirit and these three are one he could not find it in a Greek manuscript so he didn't put it in there but the church didn't like that at all because the whole church system was basically overshadowed by the main doctrine the trinity that started in the roman catholic church and was also later adopted by the reformed church so the church put more and more pressure on erasmus to put it in there but erasmus said i'm not gonna put it in my translation if you can't provide me with a greek manuscript where this verse is in there. So what did the church do? I think it was in Oxford. They made up in the 16th century a document, a Greek text with this verse in it. It's called the Texas uh, Britannicus. And this verse, 1 John 5, 7, it's called the Comma Johannium. It is a forgery. So 1 John 5, 7 is a 16th century forgery that also ended up in the King James. So what does 1, 1 John 5, 7 actually say? For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are in agreement. Nothing about the Trinity. But many Christians keep persisting. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, nowhere in Scripture, and I, wanna, I, I want to I challenge you, if you believe that God the Son is somewhere in there to find it because you'll find that the Son of God is found all over the place but never once never once is Jesus called God the Son zero times so why do Christians persist in calling it the Trinity God the Father God the Son God the it is not there why do Christians make up things right there's one verse day, then, then they go, yes, there is one time that Jesus is called God the Son, and that is in Hebrews 1 8. But unto the Son he said, Thy throne, O God. It still doesn't say God the Son, but I already covered this verse. If you just read the next verse, which they never quote, the next verse says, Even, but therefore God, even thy God, see, this God has a God. How can God have a God? Because the word Fails is also used for men. Men in a position of authority were called gods. Elohim. Fails. But this Fails, the Son, has a God. And that is God Almighty. But besides this, 
There is not one verse in the entire Bible that calls Jesus God the Son. So another verse they sent me is Colossians 2, 9. In the King James it reads, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, Jesus is the Godhead, or the Godhead is in him bodily. Godhead, see, Godhead means three in one. So in this case, there are two others that dwell in Jesus or something. But Godhead means three in one. Well, this is an other strange translation, because if you just look at the Greek, and I'll show it here, it says, it's talking about deity. Deity. Right? We know that God, uh, that Jesus was given the Spirit without measure. The fullness of the Spirit was in him. Right? The Bible says God was in Christ. The Bible doesn't say Christ was God. The Bible says that God was in Christ. Therefore, you know, the deity was in him. The Spirit was to him given without measure. But ironically, Paul warns us in the very verse that comes before it, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That is exactly what they do with this trinity. It is philosophy, deceit, it is traditions of men, right? People go after trinities rather than after Christ. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles than thou dost, except God be with him. With him. God is with him. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, and is now, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Is God with you? Some even claim, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, does that make you God? So listen what the disciples preached after Jesus ascended into heaven to the right hand of God and after Pentecost when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen what they preached. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Hear these words, not those words or those words or your pastor's words or the Roman Catholic words or the, the Calvinist words or the Trinity words. Hear these words, because these words are from the disciples. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. I bet if Trinitarians were alive in the time of Acts, they would have refuted the disciples, how dare you call Jesus a man approved of God? Jesus is God Almighty himself. How dare you? The Trinities would even went against the anointed disciples, trying to tell them that Jesus is God Almighty, rather than to just believe the words of the disciples. So another verse Trinitarians sent me to prove the Trinity is John 4, 23. So let's read it. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I hope you already can see the irony. They try to show me the Trinity. But it says clearly that the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers, are you a true worshipper? The true worshipper will shall worship the Father. Right? In spirit and in truth. In truth. But they say, well, it is the Father in spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and truth, that's Jesus. See, that's the Trinity. That is the the mind gymnastics they put into this, the things they read into the text, it is enormous. It simply says that the true worshippers will worship the Father. 
because Jesus made sure that you can worship the Father. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. It doesn't say, for the Trinity seeketh such to worship him. It says, the Father shall seek those that worship him. But you cannot just worship him, you have to do it in truth. Right? And Jesus taught us the truth. He showed us the truth. Right? This is our high priest, mediator. By him, we can now come to the Father so we can worship the Father. But in churches, the only one who is worshipped is Jesus. The Father is never worshipped in these churches. So when you go to a church, God is not really worshipped. All the worship goes to the Son of the living God. The living God, the Father, is put on the sideline. The only moment that God the Father is mentioned in the opening prayer of the service where they said, Father God, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. But it is just a ritualistic mem that they, they repeat. And the rest of the service is only devoted to the Son. There is no worship to the Father. And that's very hypocritical because they believe in a trinity. But they don't wor even worship the trinity. All worship goes to one member of this trinity. But Jesus is not God Almighty. The Father is God. Thousands upon thousands of times we see that Jehovah is the Father and He is the only true God. It's because also of a great misconception of the meaning of worship. Yes, only God the Father says, I will not share my glory with anyone. Only God the Father can be worshipped as being God Almighty. Then is it wrong to worship Jesus? No, for if you understand what worship means. Worship is paying an homage, paying respect. You can pay respect and homage to your God, but also to your king, anointed by God. And I'll show you in this verse. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshipped the Lord and the King. The Lord and King David. What is the, Who is the Lord? And that is also another misconception. But first of all, the Lord is in the Hebrew, Yahovah or Yahweh. So, who is worshipped? Yah, Yahweh and King David both received worship of the congregation. And that's the problem with this translation. For every time you see the, the four letter tentagram, Yahweh, Yahovah, Yod, He, Fa, He, they translate it into Lord. And your whole life you hear, Jesus is Lord. See, it's that same Lord. No, there's a Lord God and the Lord Jesus. And the Lord God made Jesus our Lord. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Trinitarians, every time they see the word Lord, they automatically say, oh, that is Jesus. While the text is very clear, there is only one Lord God. Right? Here Israel, the Lord your God, is one Lord, the Lord God. And this God made Jesus your Messiah, your King, your Lord. Even in Revelation we still see the same thing. And the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It's irrefutable that you have a Lord God and his Christ. So then the next verse they stumble upon is Colossians um, 1.16, right, where it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. See, everything was created by Jesus. That makes Jesus God Almighty. Let's take a look at this whole chapter, starting in 1.3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ has a God and Father. So why does 116 says that Jesus created everything? The context and what this chapter is talking about, it's talking about the risen Christ. 
the new creation. Everything becomes new. The believers, Christ in the believers. So what things are created in this new creation through Jesus, right? Things that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities of powers, all things were created by him and for him or unto him. So it's not talking about that Jesus created the mountains and the animals and the rivers and humanity. No, it says that in the new creation, all these things like dominions, principality and powers, all these things are created in Christ. In the new creation, you are in Christ. And this new is created through Christ, for by him all these things were created. And he's before all things, and by him all things consist in this new creation. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the first from born from the dead, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the Lord, right? He is the king. He has the preeminence. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. See, God wants to reconcile all things to himself, who? By Jesus. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. God wants to reconcile everything, restore everything, and he uses Jesus and Jesus must reign till he has defeated all enemies and then even Jesus will hand everything over to God why would Paul feel the need to tell everybody that God created everything of course that was all known duh right Paul was not saying God created everything he is talking about the new creation in Christ so it is very important to learn to read entire chapters and don't put Trinitarian bias in the verse because most Trinitarians never read the whole verse and they only go to the little part that he everything was created by him see see he must be God Almighty there's no context right so let me go to the last one today the one um, they also always use to um, to prove the Trinity or that Jesus is God is Philippians 2 6 who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So being in the form of God, right? The form that means he's God Almighty being in the form of someone else or that he didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. It doesn't say he is equally God because if he didn't think it was robbery to be equal with someone, right? You have two gods on your hands. But Trinitarian mind wants so desperately to read things into the text which simply aren't there you cannot create two gods and i'll say no they are, so, they are one they're one god right so what did jesus mean what is this chapter talking about right just to read let, let's read chapter 2 till uh, verse 10 and then you'll see the context of what is really going on here if there be Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. Paul saying, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. See that? One again, being one, one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves, right? Be humble, right? Who is our perfect example of this? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, right? Love each other, take care of each other, right? Humble yourself. Let this mind be in you, because Jesus is our ultimate example right which was also in jesus christ jesus christ also had that mindset right jesus christ was very humble and only thought about other people put other peoples before himself who was in the form of god 
thought of that robbery to be equal with God, equality. I'll have to make an entire video about what it means to be equal with, in the Jewish law, in a nutshell, in the Jewish law, in the law of agency, the sendee was considered equal to the sender because he spoke the same words. But Jesus said, I have all this authority has been given to me. But even though Jesus had all this authority, he made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was make, made in the likeness of man. So Christians think that it says that God uh, humbled himself and took upon uh, the, the form of a man. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about even though Jesus had all this authority, he humbled himself and he became a servant, right? Just like the rest of us, right? He didn't make himself more than that. And being found in a fashion as a man, being found just like us, just like us, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death on the cross. God cannot die! Jesus died. He was obedient unto death. And therefore, God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Right? Not a name above Jehovah, but a name above everything of creation. That the name of Jesus, every new Shabbat, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Amen so this whole context and sometimes Paul uh, is a bit, a bit hard to read especially with the English translations and we have learned to read so many things in the text but it is just simply telling us listen Jesus was our example right he was a man just like us but he had the authority given by god but nevertheless he humbled himself he became one of us and he was obedient unto death and he is exalted right so that you may know that he is lord and one day every tongue will confess every kneel shall bow and every tongue will confess that jesus is lord to the glory of god the father that will be the ultimate glory for god the father so even after these three videos, uh, with all these verses, there, there, there's still people who would say, yeah, but what about this verse? Okay, <laughs> that never ends. That's fine, because I love to explain everything. This is what I love to do. It is just beautiful. And um, the more you understand the scripture, what it actually says, the more you start to relate to Jesus. He be you become his brother and not a distant God you cannot understand. A distant God that is some kind of mystery that you will never understand with your feeble minds. No, now you can relate to, to, to someone, to Jesus, because he's the way to the Father. Now you can have a relationship with the Father. And the more you understand this, and sometimes it can take a while before you fully start to see this, but the more you start to see this, the more God is no longer a mystery and the closer you start to feel to God because of the truth because the Father is looking for those who worship Him in spirit and truth right so if there is any verse let me know in the comment section and I will handle everything yeah God bless